Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled Getting It Right the First Time, Reaching One Peripheral Intervenous Catheter Per Patient Visit with Lean Multimodal Strategy. I'm Judy Thompson, Director of Clinical Education for the Association for Vascular Access. I want to throw a big shout out and thank you to Eloquest Healthcare for sponsoring today's event. Now, the housekeeping out of the way, I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Lee Steer is a registered nurse, CRNI, and board certified in vascular access. He's led the IV team at Hartford Hospital for 15 years. This team's most recent accomplishment was the completion of a study which resulted in the implementation of all PIV catheters being inserted on the inpatient units at Hartford Hospital using a vascular access RN and a five rights bundle. Lee is a member of the hospital's HII committee and is the chair of the HHC patient care clinical value team subgroup. Lee has spoken at multiple local and national infusion and vascular access conferences on CLABSI prevention, CVAT occlusion management, and over the past year, he's been speaking about the success of PIV insertions using a vascular access nurse and a bundled approach. Without further ado, Lee, take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. Um, I wanted to first quickly just say, you know, uh, to all my healthcare friends out there, I want to thank you all, especially those on the front lines for uh, for doing what we do every single day. I mean, I know we all signed up for this, but I don't think anybody ever imagined that, that we'd be living through a um, pandemic of uh, such magnitude that we are um, dealing with today. So thank you to all. So uh, Judy, thank you for the great introduction. Um, these are my disclosures, and I just wanted to uh, uh, say a special thank you to Eloquist Healthcare for sponsoring um, this, uh, this webinar today, and we'll get right going. Um, so some of our learning objectives, we're going to do a little, uh, we're going to talk a lot about lean thinking as it applies to vascular access and how we can use it to overcome the challenges that we as clinicians face in healthcare and how you can use it to your advantage to um, help justify um, reducing waste in your organizations. I'm also going to then talk about the bundle that we used and created using a Six Sigma design to uh, create a bundle that would achieve one PIVC per patient. We did a study on it and I'll show you the results of that. And then we're gonna talk a lot about the results of the study and what that has done for us clinically and financially here at Hartford Hospital. So Hartford Hospital, for those of you who have ever been here, we were at once the insurance capital of the world. It was built um, in the 1800s. It's uh, right in the center of Connecticut. It's a level one trauma center, 867 licensed beds. We're one of the largest employers in the state of Connecticut. And what I really wanna focus on is our core values. We, uh, this is our branding that we all wear every single day. We come to work on our uniforms. We do a lot with integrity, caring, excellence, and safety. And I think as you uh, listen to what we've done here at Hartford Hospital as a team, meaning the IV team, uh, we've really focused a lot on those core values to drive um, what we are doing here um, with IV therapy um, for our patients. So we're going right into a poll question. Take it away, Judy. Let's see, here we go. Is the facility you're working at adopting lean methodology? Yes or no? It's a pretty quick one. Oh, we're kind of going 50-50. I'll give you a few more seconds because only about 40% of you have voted thus far. Okay, we at least passed 50. Three, two, one, let's close that and share the results with you. So 56% no and 44 yes. Okay, so I couldn't really see that, Judy. I don't know why, but that's okay um, because you told me the results. So for <laughs> those of you who are using lean, um, you know, it, it, lean is definitely starting to play a big part in healthcare. And lean was first established in the manufacturing um, division, and really, it's an to me, it's it's a huge advantage um, because it's a it's a systematic approach with project planning, implementing plans, and evaluating outcomes. Many people are familiar familiar with the PDSA Plan Do Study Act. When we were developing our study, we use the DMAIC, um, Six Sigma process, DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. 
So what is lean healthcare? And it really is, um, to keep it simple, it's about eliminating waste in every process, procedure, and task through an ongoing system of improvement. Six Sigma is a management tool used in organizations to improve business processes by reducing the likelihood of errors occurring. So every single day prior to the start of our shift, usually 7 a.m., our night shift comes and they give us reports. What we do is we have a huddle board and we look, we do daily huddles. So we'll do a bunch of different things. First, we recognize staff. Then we do daily announcement, what's going on in the organization. We look at our playbook. What do we have on for staff for day, that day and how are we gonna manage what we need to do? We also have a few metrics. One of them's on central line rounding. We have one on our inclusion management program, and then there's patient satisfaction. So it's all focused on quality and patient safety. We also discuss new ideas that staff come up with, and they usually put it, they put it on these little cards or they'll just speak them out. And we just try to decide whether it's going to be easy to accomplish or is it not going to be easy to accomplish, and then assign it to certain people. And one of the ideas that we had come up with or the staff presented during this daily huddle was, why are we not going clinically indicated? And we're gonna talk a little bit more on our, our journey with that. We also talk about standard work and what is standard work? And that is just making sure that everybody is on the same page, following the same process when dealing with patient care issues. Um, so again, with our set, we have two different types of standard work that we do. We do it on our central lines and we do it on our peripheral IVs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the bottom line is lean puts the patient at the center. And I encourage all of you out there who do have lean in your facilities, use it to your advantage. Because if your C-suite and your upper administration is adopting lean methodology, they want to eliminate waste. And we're gonna see how wasteful IV therapy can be. So when we talk about PDSA, this is just, you know, kind of a process and this is just things to consider when you're, if you're doing a PDAS format, you know, you want to pre-plan. So determine the need for whatever you're trying to accomplish. And again, for us, it was looking at going clinically indicated. And this is the sort of the steps we follow. We created a charter. We wrote a protocol for our study timeline you know, communicated that plan, conducted the study, analyzed the data, and then did a presentation to our CNO. But what we really focused on for us was using the Six Sigma methodology. I really like the way, I guess I just like the way the Mayak sounds, but um, anyway, so what, what did we do first? We wanted to define what was our goal to get to clinically indicated. We also wanted to make sure that we used one IV per patient stay. Now, obviously we know two patients can have two, sometimes three IVs, but the bottom line is that IV we put in, we wanted to make sure that it was gonna last from the beginning to the end of therapy. So then we had to measure. How were we going to measure being able to do this? We looked at many published studies, over 100. We looked at our consumption data. We looked at delays in IV therapy. What did our patients say? And patients telling us they got five, stuck five, 10 different times. What was our length of stay? And if those delays were affecting our length of stay, how long and how much time were we spending training new people coming into the hospital? And what's the current workforce like? We uh, again analyze that data. So everything that we first gathered in the measure phase, we analyzed it and then we went to improve. So in, to, in order to improve what we were measuring and analyzing and to get to our goal, we performed our study, which we'll go over. We did it over about 15 months. We had dedicated nurses doing the data collection and we used an iPad app that actually downloaded the information into an iCloud. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that more later. One of the biggest things is we use pictures to support our assessments and the data that we collected. Once we were done with the study, we went to control. Control was taking all that um, DMAIC process and what it did is we did a presentation to our CNO. We did a business case for a return on investments. We got FTEs reallocated to the IV team and now we're presently working on real-time tracking of work productivity and outcomes. Again, big, talks of conversation out there, the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, put out a call to action to reduce waste in the U.S. healthcare system and return the cost savings to patients and the economy. Derek Foley, the president and CEO of the IHI, said waste is an endemic in healthcare. Health system leaders and all who work in healthcare need to heed this call. Um, and, and look at what really is waste, IV therapy, 
is waste, the amount of catheters we use, the amount of central lines we use, and we're going to look at that in a few minutes. But I, what I wanted to show is just CLABSIS. Look at, we are spending in 2018 $1.4 billion, and that is not reimbursed back to us. Our gross domestic product, which should be low in healthcare, it was 6% in 1917. The, Healthcare, the world's budget is 17% now, and that was in 2015, and it's just expected to climb and climb and climb. So really, there is a true um, call out there to reduce waste as much as we possibly can. Sorry, guys. So here is waste. In 2018, the population of the United States was 327 million. In 2018, 18, there was 350 million peripheral IV catheters sold more catheters sold than there are people in the United States. If you do the math, there was 37 million admissions to hospitals in 2018. If you divide 37 million into 350 million, it comes out to about 10 catheters per patient stay. Now, of course, we all know that there's outpatients. It's just a figure that kind of gives you an idea of how bad it really is. So, is there an opportunity to eliminate waste with peripheral IVs and using lean methodology? Is Are we being lean with them? 350 million catheters, and I just took a price of $1.50, and I think that's on the lower side, comes out to uh, $525 million spent. Now, if we look at the literature, the average cost of a PIV insertion is about $28. 350 million times $28, $9.8 billion spent on peripheral IV catheter therapy. I do not think that is being lean at all. So why is it important that we look at this? Not only from costs, from outcomes, from everything, but let's talk about the patient. Colleen Sweeney is an RN. She's a national expert in the customer patient experience. We had the privilege of having her come to our facility and give a presentation to our, to our team. She had done a survey of, well, I think it was a thousand, maybe a little bit over that, of, of patients who had been hospitalized. And what were their 10 top fears of being hospitalized? Needles was number six. And if you look down at number nine, they were more concerned about getting poked with needles than they were about what their diagnosis and prognosis were going to be. So it is a real fear of patients. And it's an expectation. They know they're going to go in and they know that they're going to get stuck. If you look to the left, CMS, about hospital value-based purchasing, okay? It's, a, it's paid for for the quality of care, not the quality of procedures that we perform. So we're just, again, throwing money into the trash, out the windows, every time we pick up an IV catheter that we don't successfully get in. It's funded by the Centers for Medicare um, and Medicare Services, and the hospital's value-based program is, is funded using hospitals-based operating payments. So they basically, per every DRG, they take a right pay 2% of that, keep it, and then those hospitals that do really well, they give it back, give it back to them. So you're technically kind of losing twice. Patient experience is a big part of that value-based purchasing program. So again, looking at the patient, we always have to return to our old friend Florence Nightingale. And she basically said to us the first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. We are causing harm to patients by stabbing them multiple times. What does that lead to? We know that it leads to trauma, to inflammation, the clotting cascade. We know that it leads to pain, discomfort. There's so much to it. And, you know, as a healthcare provider, I know that I did not go into healthcare to harm patients. I wanted to do the right thing. And I think we all can agree to that. So why has, you know, why are we not paying attention to peripheral IVs? It affects 90% of all hospitalized patients. Now I can remember back when I first became a nurse, maybe 50% of my patients had an IV catheter and giving patients IM injections in their gluteal muscles was a, one of the things that we did. Demerol and Vistral was one of the most popular combinations of drugs that we gave. Times have changed. We give everything IV. Times have changed. We have not. So now 90% of all patients are getting peripheral IV. And we know that if that patient gets a BSI, 12 to 25% of them are going to die. The other thing we know about BSIs, or, um, or, or we can even talk about CLABSIs, we can put it in the same bunch, but that they are the most expensive hospital-acquired condition to treat. Anywhere, I think the last literature I saw, in, uh, uh, to treat a CLABSI costs about $48,000. Again, not reimbursable. 
it affects the patients because some of them may pass, some of them may need further care down the road if they were in the hospital for a prolonged period of time to regain their strength. Um, we get have to publicly report it, and then it affects our scores at the end of the year when we get our hospital acquired condition score called the HAC scores. I know what we lost here last year at Hartford Hospital. I'm not gonna say the number, but I'll tell you it was in the millions of dollars. So we all need to do better. We also know that uh, there's been a lot of comparisons made between safety management and aviation and healthcare. And these are a couple of great articles that I, I, I put in here as a reference for you to, to um, reference after this, this webinar. This emulation is the context of major achievements that have occurred in the field of aviation, despite the number of worldwide flight hours doubling over the past 20 years from approximately 25 million in 1993 to 54 million in 2013. The number of fatalities has fallen from approximately 450 to 250 per year. So this stands in a stark comparison to healthcare, where in the USA alone, there are an estimated 200,000 preventable medical deaths every year which amounts to the equivalent almost three fatal airline crashes per day. So there is literature out there. Um, Claire Ricard had come up with a, I believe it was one of the first studies, 53% of catheters fail to make it to the end of treatment. Now, can you imagine if you knew that if you were going to get on a plane, because we're doing this comparison, that you had a 53% chance of getting home, I highly doubt that you would um, buy a plane ticket. I'm sure you go rent a car at that point in time. And we all know that when a plane goes down, what's the first thing they do? They find a flight recorded, like listen to determine the cause of the accident. Robert Helm, LMD, very uh, great article, the accepted but unacceptable. Look at his quotes. A failed IV catheter means pain, dissatisfaction, prolongation of care, and venous depletion, compounded by the need to treat minor and se severe IV catheter failure and related sequelae. We know why catheters fail. Look at what happens to the patient and the caregiver. It's a, a traditionally has been accepted it is necessary additional work to be performed. So what happens? Do we do a root cause and analysis with every catheter that fails? No, we go in, we pull it out. We might throw a warm soak on if it's an infiltration. We pray that it wasn't a vesicant that's gonna lead to extravas extravasation. And then we go to the other arm and we drop another line in. And if we miss the first time, oh well, we just drop in another, we just look for another vein and try again. And if that person fails, let's go find somebody else to try twice. And then we'll finally call the IV team. So we're, you know, to compare us to the, flight, the airline industry, just to me, seems like a very different comparison. It's like comparing apples and oranges. I love Henry Ford. Most people spend more time and energy going around problems than trying to solve them. Is that not true with IV therapy? We know why IV catheters fail. Infiltrations, extravasations, um, phlebitis, infection, inadvertent removal, and occlusions. And there are ways that we can deal with these problems so that our catheters will last longer. So removing peripheral IVs, peripheral IVs when clinically indicated. What does it mean? The remove, you remove it when it's symptomatic or no longer, longer indicated. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures of a patient who came to our facility and had this IV inserted. I won't tell you where, because I don't want to throw anybody into the bus, but clearly evidence-based best practice was not utilized. We see an 18 gauge in the wrist of a very frail elderly person, and then clearly not taped well. The tegaderm didn't last on that patient, it lifted right up. And what happened? The end result was a bad infiltration. This patient could not speak for themselves. They could not say what was going on. So it wasn't even picked up until that was found. Anytime I do a lecture to new hires coming in here, one of the questions I ask them is, have you ever had an IV infiltrate in your arm? The hands go up. Not once have I ever had somebody tell me that it felt good. They hurt. So we need to make sure that when we were looking at this as a project and an idea to go from routine site of removal to clinically indicated, we wanted to make sure that we were gonna protect these sites from those um, complications that occur with peripheral IVs. Cool question. All right. How frequently are you rotating your PIV sites? Every 72, 36 to 30, 96 hours? Clinically indicated or you're not sure or it's variable? You guys are quicker to vote on this one. 
when pressed. Okay, we'll give you a couple more seconds. I just have to tell me the results. Poll. I'll give you the answers here, Lee. <laughs> answers are 18% um, are 72 to 96 hours, 78% are clinically indicated, and 4% are not quite sure or it's variable. Got it. Was there another poll question right after that, Judy, or we, does that one come a little bit later? There certainly could be. Um, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> If you are clinically indicated, are you using, and now we want you to click all that apply. We have antimicrobial dressing, antimicrobial disc, tissue adhesive, specialized dressing, or and or manufactured securement device. Okay, we're gonna wait a couple more seconds to let a few more of you vote. We'll close this poll and share the results. So we have 22% are using an antimicrobial dressing, 14% are using a disc, 23% are using tissue adhesive, almost half at 48% specialized dressing, and 46% are using a securement device. Very good. Very interesting. So some, it sounds like, are protecting with, with all different types of devices and some may not be. So that was our call to action. If we were gonna to go to clinically site, um, clinically indicated site removal from routine, we wanted to make sure, again, we were gonna protect all these sites that we put in from all the five complications that can occur with IV therapy. But on that part, we also wanted to make sure that we were gonna put it in the hands of the experts and that's what we have done. So in order to do that, we needed to collect data. Now data will allow you to garner the support you need with key leadership. And again, because we're a lean facility, we knew that our study was gonna show how much waste we were producing in healthcare. And as good old Edward Stemming had said, in God we trust all others must bring data. I'll never forget when I visited a VP in Ohio one of their hospitals out there, he had that in big, bold letters right up above his head in his office, and I, it's so true. And there's a many ways you can collect data, folks. Um, I know that obviously doing an IRB-approved clinical study is great because you can publish and you can share results, but it is a little difficult at times to do, and, and why do people not do study? Well, from what I've heard out there, it takes a lot of time. Research seems so time-consuming. It is. But again, not everybody has to do an IRB approved research study to get what you need. You can collect small amounts of data on just certain problems and still be able to use it to garnish um, support from your upper leadership in terms of getting some equipment that you may need as well as maybe additional FTEs. And again, number two reason that I hear out there is support. I don't know how to get it off the ground or how do I get the resources to get this going? I do understand I am very fortunate here. I, you know, at one point I was the manager of the IV team. I was also the manager of a 24 in bed infectious disease unit. And honestly, when I was the manager of that unit, it was very hard for me to be able to do the attention I wanted to the IV team. I wasn't able to do it justice. So at one point in time, I was very fortunate to be able to make a presentation to my senior leadership and they, were, they said to me, okay, you're very passionate about this. We can tell we will give you the IV team. We'll take away the medical surgical unit. And, you know, you may continue on your goal and vision. And my vision, I started 15 years ago. I wanted the IV placements, IV catheters put in the hands of the experts. So what did we do? We did an IRB, Internal Review uh, Perspective Multimodal Comparator Study, and obviously our aim, which we talked about, was to go from routine site replacement to clinically indicated. So our primary objective was to look at dwell time and complication rates, comparing it to current um, way we were putting on IVs. Our time frame, we did it in about 15 months. It was, we were thought we'd get it done in a year. Obviously, there were factors that prevented us from getting it done in our time frame. We picked one unit. I always uh, joke because uh, we picked a 47 bed medical unit and the reason we picked it because it was strategically located right outside my office door so I never had to walk too far um, in order to see how the study was going. 
we had our research senior scientists perform all the statistical analysis and it was powered for 110 sites and we collected the data using an iCloud based iPad app called Command App and you'll see some a little bit of that later. One of the first things we did again if you were looking at a PDSA format um, we, we wanted to pre-plan so we wanted to determine the need. Now how did we do that? We took two very unemotional numbers. You can't argue it. Number of admissions at your hospital, which anybody can pull offline. And then I worked with my supply chain team to get the number of purple catheters that we purchased annually. We took that number and we divided the number of admissions into the number of purple ID catheters. It gave us a baseline number. And we were using, not, it gave us a baseline number of 9.4 catheters per patient admission. Later on, you'll see how we broke that number down to make sure that we were looking at just those catheters that we would be responsible if we took over and, and we were putting in. So we took all the outpatient areas out of that. It's a great way to start. Just determine, do you really have a problem? And we created this uh, financial benefit little wheel that we've got um, that we give access to. Um, at some point in time, but it, it uses um, a hospital size. It uses a certain um, calculation to determine the number of catheters you use in. Can you look at your admissions? And then uh, we look at how we used the results of our studies and, and came up with that calculation. So then you really want, we had to do some planning. Again, we wanted to make sure that we approved outcomes and reduced costs. So some of the questions that we would ask yourself and I would suggest you do, what is your plan? Again, we wanted to go to um, routine to clinically indicated. We hope that it produced uh, better results than one in every two catheters failing to make it to the end of treatment. We picked our, our population and our, and our time limit as we discussed. And just some questions that we had to ask ourselves, you know, so is this gonna, is there a need in our facility? Um, we wanted, to, again, these are some of the answers we came up with. We wanted to expand our team and get to a point where one, peripheral catheter for patient visits and how we're we going to do that. We're going to study it and create our ideal future state. So this is the iPad app that we use for our data collection. It really held us accountable. So um, there was many different screens to it. So this is just one. So when we came into evaluating a peripheral IV, we would pick the location, we would pick the catheter and the type that we use. And the great thing is with those little holes on the hand there, the black holes, you would just hit that and it would auto-populate. We also had the ability to scan the patient's ID band. We also used um, a survey to um, gauge patient satisfaction. And instead of us doing it, we would hand it to the patient. We would have them answer these four questions. And when they hit next, it downloaded it into the iCloud. So it was protected. We couldn't go back and see what they had said about us. So if they thought our experience was really bad and they were scared to tell us, they didn't have to worry about that because it was gone the minute they hit next. The ID scan uh, capability was great. Unfortunately, it was one of those sticky points with the IRB um, due to you know PHI data. So we, we just ended up assigning patients a random number to that. We also were able to download our hospital's formulary into the iPad app. So we daily would go in, look at if the meds are changed, and then we'd adjust that. So we have a ton of data that's just sitting there waiting for us to even further analyze. And this is what the screen would look like. So when we would sign on, and let's say we were going to assess the site that we had put in, you can see the little bit of patient information was there with the drugs and the fluids that were on the bottom, their diagnosis, the date they're admitted. And then it gave us the IV site information and any, any complications. And if you look down where that big black square is, that's where the picture was. So if you did a, an assessment and, and, and rated everything to be perfect, if the picture didn't match it, it was it really, so that's kind of where it held us accountable. We had to make sure that you know, we could take every single assessment we did and match it to a picture that was taken. Ready for another poll question? All right, are you using a bundled approach when inserting PIVs? Quick yes or no. About half of you that are voting. Come on, participation's fun. Okay, a couple more seconds. Okay, let's close that poll and see what the results are. 50-50 exactly to bundled and non-bundled. 
great to hear some people are doing it. I think it's very important. We use it for central lines. To me, we should use it for every procedure that we're doing. So our bundle, we do coin it the PIV 5R, right approach, right result. We did get great outcomes. And you know, I what I just want to make sure it does work. And this is just a quick slide that shows you it's also reduced labor hours and supplies by um, reducing our peripheral ID placement. But I want to go into great detail in terms of what is the bundled approach that we use. So we call it, we turned it to PIV 5R. What it is is it, it kind of goes line by line, as you can see. So the right proficiency. To me, we wanted to make sure that we had the right person putting that IV in who was ultrasound guidance trained for peripheral IV insertion and demonstrated first times uh, first stick success rates. Again, if you look at our references, everything that we did to create this bundle, we used all these studies that have been published to create the right bundle that we wanted to use. Our right insertion, using the ultrasound guidance or a vein viewer for 100% success. V stands for the right, right vein and catheter, making sure that we were putting our IVs in the forearm, using, the, trying to stay away from valves that we could visualize, looking at our vein to catheter ratio, diameter and length, right supplies and technology. We're gonna talk a little bit about that moving forward on a couple of the important parts that we use, but to me, if they are out there and they are, um, you know, best of class devices, we need to be using them. So we use the procedure kit for compliance. We used mostly the 22 gauge 1.75 inch catheter. Again, in the forearm, we used an anti-reflux needle as connector that could be changed out every seven days. Um, and we also used an alcohol chlorhexidine skin preparation and the antimicrobial border determine dressing that also is good for seven days. And then R standing for the right review and assessment. We, every single day we went back, we scrubbed those hubs, we flushed it, and we documented that assessment and, and assessment and did a dressing change if needed. So when we talk about the PIV portion, right, proficiency, right insertion, right vein and catheter, again, placement is crucial to the success of the catheter. You have to avoid the point of flexion. It's just a must. That is one of the number one contributors to IV failure, that catheter, micro pistoning back and forth, occlusions, you know, causing vessel, um, causing inflammation and irritation to the endothelial lining is just gonna cause that catheter to fail quickly. Where was our target zone? Most of the time we were picking the cephalic vein, which has a great flow rate of 20 to 40 cc's per minute. We never went beyond a depth of more than about a three quarters of a centimeter. The ideal target range was 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 centimeters, because what happens is if we were going too deep and trying to maintain that right angle so that the catheter didn't include when we tape down, then you were going to lose um, catheter into the vein ratio. And again, just using the longer catheter. When we use the dressing, the chlor um, chlorhexidine impregnated formant IV secure dressing, we chose one that had pure CHX impregnated into it. Why did we like it? Because the minute that you put that dressing onto that site, it's rapid onset of action. And if you look at all the various um, pathog um, bacteria pathogens that can end up on the skin, we had a we wanted one that was gonna maintain high level efficiency levels from day one through day seven. And you can see pretty much that this dressing maintains that very well. So pretty much it was like dropping a bomb, I don't know if it's gonna work. Oh, there it is, onto um, that dressing and killing anything that occurs. When we talk about blood reflux, um, blood reflux is um, leads to occlusions. Occlusions is the number one cause for catheter failure. So we decided to use um, an anti-reflux needles connector, and why? Again, to avoid catheter blood from refluxing back into the catheter, which leads to a, a small, teeny little clot. Now, nobody thinks that can cause too much damage, but just imagine what you do when you give a little bit of PSI pressure on that syringe and you feel that little pop that occurs. What does it, what is that? That's the catheter, blow, the, the clot blowing out of the tip of that catheter and it ruptures. It just doesn't go out straight. It actually explodes out of there. So again, you're blasting high pressure clots and fluid against the endothelial lining, which is super sensitive. Why? Because it protects us from clotting off. And again, that leads to trauma, then leads to inflammation, and that will lead to platelet ag aggregation, which is going to eventually result in catheter failure. So we like this because it kept the blood out, um, unintentional blood refluxing from outside of that catheter 24 seven. We had a huge success with our TPA reduction 
of greater than 50% using this anti-reflux needles connector on our central lines. So we wanted to make sure we used it on our peripherals as well. We loved it also because it's not people dependent. It means there's no clamping sequence. It's clear, straight blue pathway and has a 300 degree, uh, 360 degree compressible seal. So it pretty much met all the, um, the literature that out there says to say which one is the best needles catheter that exists. So I always say pictures are worth a thousand words. And, and this is what I felt was very successful to garnishing the support that we needed from our leadership. As you can see, this is not lean. This is waste, variability, and just multiple defects. We had patients that were arriving, nothing was consistent. The only thing that was consistent was either it was placed in the hand or it was placed in the antecubital fossa. But the taping was different. Some patients arrived without tegaderms on them and just paper tape, blood in the tubing. We have the old famous EMS um, style tegaderm with the foam border. Um, some were barely taped at all. A lot of them were leaking. They just were not good looking sites. And these were actual patients that we had admitted to the study. I'm a little embarrassed to show them, but I like to show these a little bit more because these are what we use. And what do you see here? Again, you see standard work. Everybody doing the same thing. We used evidence-based practice. We put it in the forearm. We used mostly a 22-gauge catheter unless a 20 was warranted based on vessel size or if the patient needed a, a CT scan or, or high fluid volume. We used the antimicrobial dressing. We secured it the same way. We used the anti-reflux needles connector to a microbore extension set. That is what you see at Hartford Hospital right now. You can also see that it's dated and timed, and I don't think any of those sites prior had that on there. What were the results of our study? So our first stick success rate, um, our, we, the, we just um, we didn't capture the number of first time um, the number of attempts by group one, which was the standard way of inserting IV here at Hartford Hospital, and these were mostly ER and EMS sites. We evaluated a total of 94, so we used the, lit the current literature, which is about 33% first success rate. In our group, of where we evaluated 113 sites, we had a 96% first success rate. You can see our catheters lasted 89% of the time from beginning to the end of therapy, whereas group one only 15%. The dwell time with the mean standard deviation, we our, our dwell time was 71.4 hours, while the control group was 29.6. The highest um, time a catheter lasted was 331 point, uh, 30, 333 hours in our group, whereas the control group was 111, or as we say, group one. The complication rate for group one was 40%, ours 11%. And then we did a whole cost analysis on it and found out that we had a potential to save our hospital $3,376 per bed. I go into much detail with that. That leads us into our next poll question. All right. Do you know your cost per bed for IV therapy? I can't wait to get the results of this year. Yeah. This is interesting. Give it about five more seconds. Okay, close this poll and share the results. 95% do not know their number. Um, but the good part is 5% five, 5 do. <laughs> and I didn't answer. I didn't say it, so I'm not one of the 5%. Not very many people do, and I would bet if you gave that same question to CNO and CFOs, they would answer it exactly the same. It's amazing. Again, it just goes to show you, we are not paying attention to IV therapy in our hospitals. We have no idea, but you saw earlier, we are spending $9.8 billion a year on IV therapy. And I tell you, we can reduce that and we need to. And I think someday, we're all gonna be held accountable to all hospital acquired infections and outcomes. And I'll tell you when that day comes, we're all gonna be scrambling, trying to figure out how to solve the problem of peripheral IVs. And I think that's a big reason why we're not paying that much attention to it. You talk about a central line and everybody starts to, you know, shake in their chairs and get nervous because God forbid we get a clapsy, but we know that peripheral IVs are just as bad 
if not worse, in my opinion. It's just that the rates look lower because we put so many of them in. So um, let's go to the next slide. And as you're going to see, you see a pretty high number. IV cost $4.1 million or $4,781 per bed. So earlier I had talked about um, doing your pre-planning and looking at do you really have a problem at your hospital? And we looked at looking at the number of catheters bought versus the number of mits. So I told you that later on, I was gonna show you how we reduced that number. So as our numbers of admits at that point in 2018 was 44,949. 75% of those um, we looked at, so we took about 25% of those admits away because we knew that many of those patients were gonna get an IV started in the um, pre-op line area, and then they were gonna get admitted to the floor. A lot of those patients would get their line inserted in the ED. Now we do a lot of those, so we didn't, take out all of those patients, but a lot of those patients would get their IV inserted down in the ED and then been admitted to the floor. So we looked at all these varying numbers that we had, number of admits to the hospital, number of um, OR patients, number of ED admissions, and came up with 75% of the patients. If we were able to see and apply our study results to it, you'll see how we came up with a, with a, the cost of pepper savings. So looking at current state, or this is actually past state because our current state is different, but um, what were we looking at? So the number of minutes, 3,486. That year in 2018, we used 247 catheters. We purchased that many. So 75% of that comes up to 140,200. So if you take the number of admits into that number of catheters, it gives you 4.4 catheters per patient stay. Then we broke that down to how much time does it take if a nurse's average insertion time is 20 minutes to put in 148,200 catheters. Look at that, 49,400 hours, we turned that into an FTE of 23.75 FTEs. And, and an FTE, for those of you who don't know, is 20,800 hours. It's basically a nurse who works 40 hours, 52 days out of the year. Then we looked at labor. So how much does an RN get paid in the state of Connecticut? We looked at glassdoor.com, anybody can do it. Um, an average RN who works on the floor makes 48.50. We took 20 minutes of that time. So that comes up to 16.17. How much supplies were we gonna use? Catheter, tubing, connectors, curos, um, dis disinfection caps. Um, obviously, we're supposed to be hanging new tubing when we put in a new IV, so we took that into consideration. So the cost per IV, per IV, labor and supplies come out, comes out to $27.97. Do $27.97 times $148,200, you come up with a total number of $4.1 million. Took our beds of 867, divided that into 4.1 million, you come up with $4,781 cost per bed per IV therapy that we were doing. Then we took the, the results of our study. So if we had an 89% success rate of our catheters lasting from the beginning to the end of therapy into the number of admits, okay, that means that we would use 36,000 catheters, divide 33,000 admits into it, into that 36,000 catheters, it gives us catheter per patient visit of 1.1. Break that down again to hours, so 20 minutes for us to put an IV in. Uh, 20 minutes times 36,835 catheters gives us a time frame of 12,000 hours of nursing time for an equivalent of 5.9 FTEs. Labor, so as you can see, the labor went up. It went up from, uh, because uh, the nurses, IV trained nurses, according to Glassdoor.com, .com gets paid better than the floor nurse. Our supplies went up because we were using better supplies. So our cost per bed, our cost per IV went up to 33.08 compared to 27.97. But you still times 33.08 times the 36,000 catheters, it gives us a cost of $1.2 million. Divide the 867 beds into that, it gives us a cost per bed of 14.05. So quite a significant savings. Um, if we were to be able to manage IV therapy in our hospital. Now, I've had people say to me, well, you can't take nurses away. We didn't. Basically, in our conversation with our CNO, I told my CNO, listen, if I get the results that I did in the study, or my team does, sorry, we will spend 12,000 hours putting those IVs in. 
compared to four, nurses spending 49,000 um, hours putting in them. So instead of increasing our nursing budget, because we're such a large organization, since I'm going to save nursing time, how about we just reallocate some of those FTEs from all the nursing budgets over to us, which is what she agreed to do. So how much money are we really actually saving hospital, Hartford Hospital by doing this? You can't really put a dollar to it. You know, We needed to come up with a figure. My CNO, my CNO, CFO, we worked together. We came up with this analysis that you just saw. We can argue it. We can say what we want. It was a, it was a number. And when you're talking with C-suite folks, they want to see numbers. But as I said to my CNO when I gave her the presentation, how much can we really save by putting the IVs into the hands of experts? How much can you put dollar amount to patient satisfaction? What about you know length of stay? If we're making sure that we're putting the right catheter in, they're not having disruptions in treatment. And if that IV catheter does fail, we're right there to put a new one in. Whereas before patients were waiting three to four hours when our team was a lot smaller. We're rounding on all central lines. We're pulling out central lines left and right that don't no longer need to be there. How much can you save on each CLAPSI? $48,000. How much are we saving on treating far less adverse um, related events? And again, patient satisfaction. Okay, so there's the direct cost, obviously, of fewer restarts, which is a cost saving. We're not training nurses. Nurses are not spending as much time doing that task, and they're spending more time on assessing, planning, implementing, and evaluating the interventions that they're doing. And then there's the indirect cost that you just cannot put a cost to it. So as we came up with, we felt that this was obviously a significant cost savings associated with this whole initiative that was well beyond the cost analysis that we had done prior. So what's the payoff to my team? Okay, we are we were an IV team, we're now a VAS team, and we're collecting quality data, we're getting better outcomes. Look at the growth we've had. 2015, the IV team had seven RNs and two LPNs for a total of 7.35 FTEs. That was the year we started the study. Okay, so we finished the study a couple of years later, and just in the last three years, but mostly just the last year and a half. I have been onboarding nurses um, to create our current state of IV team of 23 RNs, 812 hours or 20.3 FT. So we have tripled in size in just over the last couple of years. How are we, how are we managing workflow right now? And we're doing it with standard work. So I, as I was telling somebody the other day, I didn't really think of our whole vision as being done in phases, but we really are kind of in that type of mode. So I look at, we're really in phase five right now. Um, and that is now that we've done the onboarding, we've done some training, it's really looking at how do we make sure we're achieving what we wanted to achieve. And that is through standard work. So we have standard work forms that everybody is familiar with. So what do we do? We divide the hospital up into four teams. Everybody has a certain amount of um, ancillary areas that they have to watch over as well as floors. We have um, daily reports that we print up of all brand new admissions to the hospital. Our goal is to make sure that we get to those patients within 24 hours of their admission um, and assess that site. If it's in per against policy, meaning in the AC hand or wrist, we will pull it out and put a new one in. Um, if it looks okay and it's in the mid forearm, we may leave it. We, we, we talk to the patient, we ask, you know, obviously the patient says, no, I want to leave the one in the AC, then we leave it there. We're starting to see an increased usage of min lines where appropriate, appropriate, and we're looking at central lines on a daily basis, evaluating for necessity. I think last month we pulled out 14 unnecessary central lines. The other day I saw um, that we have five so far in the month of March. So we're really looking at them, really evaluating every single day. And what I have completely just seen just in the last couple of weeks, because we just took our um, last person off of orientation. Sorry, we have one more person on orientation right now. I've seen the number of requests for IV therapy in our computer drop, drop dramat dramatically, which means that we're getting out there and we're getting to the patients before the nurses are evaluate them and then saying, hey, put in an order in for IV. So we're really starting to see everything gel together and get to the point where we need to be. In our huddles now, it's more teaching because 
what I do is when I hire people, I, I was telling Judy this earlier, I do not hire based on skill level. I hire based on personality. I need to be, I'm a, we're a team. We need to be able to focus and work together as a team. And that requires a lot of good communication, helping each other out. So I really do focus on how is this personality going to work with the team that I currently have? I'm not worried about the, you know, getting that person to an expert. We're going to train to get that person there. So what we do is we really focus on now in our huddles is really doing a lot of teaching and, you know, definitely trying to get everybody to, you know, to the expert level. We'll look at x-rays together. We'll talk about patient care scenarios and I'll throw out the question, okay, what was the best line of choice for this patient? Whereas before we didn't, we were, we didn't want to put midlines in anybody because we didn't know what was going to happen to that midline. Once we put it in, we were always afraid that it'd end up in an ICU and we go in there and somebody thinks it's a central line and they're hanging TPN. Now we're doing more of them because we can be out there looking at them and assessing them on a daily basis. We basically are doing this rounding from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night with our four teams, where then we drop down to two nurses who just manage calls um, that the floors have at that time. Another poll question, Judy. Oh, yay. One second. Okay, are you using tissue adhesive for CVADs to aid in dressing adherence? Yes, no, and sometimes are your options. You guys are getting quick on the voting. Loving it. Means they must be awake. <laughs> I know. Good job. Okay, we're going to close this one out. And 33% are, 46% are not, and 21% are variable. Okay. And I think there's another one to follow that. There sure the is. Same question, but we're talking about um, peripheral lines at this point. So are you using tissue adhesive for PIVs to aid in dressing adherence? Okay, and the answers are yes, 14%, no, 71, and sometimes 16%. Oh, very interesting. So, uh, again, going back to lean, trying to eliminate waste. What did we find at our hospital? Um, at, you know, with a lot of the rounding, looking at our central lines, unplanned dressing changes, be, having to change those dressings before we got the seven day mark, especially on our IJs. We do place way too many IJs in our facility. It's actually a big topic of conversation here um, with our whole HAI committee and our CLABSI team. Um, so it's something that we're going to work on. It's, it seems to be very rare lately that I see a subclavian. And with the way they're placing them being a teaching facility, there's a lot of variation in the neck where that, that line is being inserted. Gravity's you know, pulling those tubes down, and that's obviously causing dressings not to adhere, plus all the, the, the sweat up there, the hair, the drooling. So we decided that, again, we knew that I believe it's after the third unplanned dressing change, your patient um, spikes up to a ten, tenfold um, increase in developing a CLABSI. And we do have a CLABSI problem here at Hartford Hospital, I'm not gonna lie. We're, we're working very diligently to try to figure out ways to reduce that. And it's not just about getting your lines out, that's a big part of it, but there was a lot with what we recognized was our dressings just were not lasting. So we decided that we wanted to introduce, use an adhesive to eliminate those unplanned dressing changes. Um, because we also know that um, lines can be inadvertently removed, removed during that time and all the micro pissing that can occur with those. So it is currently a standard of care on all our central venous catheters. And we're gonna see the results of a study, a trial that we did with the product in a few minutes. Um, we also, so we're in the process of adding it to our central venous catheter dressing change kits. We're working on some different vendors and there's some bidding going on. We know that the only way to get full, good 90% or better compliance with that is we've got to get it into the kit. So it's one of the first things once we got it approved through our um, clinical value team was to get it into these kits as quickly as possible. So we're looking at getting into all our, all our um, uh, central line 
um, insertion kits as well as our central line dressing change kits. Um, and so right now, currently, we're using it kind of on an as-needed basis for our peripheral IVs. I think adhesive is probably the one of the most difficult things to create that's going to be effective on every single patient that's out there. Um, I think some companies have done a really great job with it. I'm very happy with the dressings that we're using. But again, it's challenging. Um, so we currently, if we feel that that patient is going to need it on their peripheral IV, um, we will use it. We are talking about at some point in time, because we are going to do another study um, at some point, we're going to do a randomized controlled on, um, well, I'm not going to tell you about it yet, it, more to come on that, but that's going to be happening very soon. And we are talking about using um, tissue adhesive um, on all peripherals at that point, um, especially with our peripheral IVs, because those are the ones that really do get removed inadvertently and the micropicity can cause that failure. So this was a trial that we used on um, in our ICUs. It was done in Bliss 10 i which is one of our cardiac ICUs. The reason we chose this, I love doing trials because I love to pick the most difficult patient. We picked the patients in this unit because they always have those big introducer cortices with the swan gans going in. They're sitting there, they're waiting for their hearts um, to come so they can get a new heart. So sometimes they'll be sitting there for weeks. Uh, before the trial, our average percent of non-intact dressings that we, we uh, so we, we collected some data pre were 77%. After the trial, 36% average not, not, were not, not intact. 0% um, were completely, were not, were, Zero percent we found after the trial were not completely detached, and zero percent were not partially detached. So really, it was just edge lifting is all that we we found. So basically, and a lot of that was around education, and so we just had to kind of remind the nurses that you really had to make sure you kind of knew where that dressing was going to fall, so you really got the edges fully down. We had to do a little bit on, um, you know, clipping hair if the person had a little bit too big of a beard, and also doubling up on the dose of the adhesive if, um, if that, if if we notice that it, this might be a problem, there was a little too much hair or such. So the cost savings obviously justify bringing this product in and use on all central lines, nursing time supplies and collapses. And one of the things that I remember the nurses say saying very quickly into the trial, they said we love this product. We used to have to change IJ dressings on a daily basis. And some of these IJ dressings, once this adhesive was put on it, lasted for the full seven days. So I am very proud to say, and we're coming down to close this. So we, uh, with all the things that we've done at Hartford Hospital, Hartford Hospital, every year, they nominate two teams, clinical team of the year and clinical support team of the year. I believe it was 26 teams had put in an application and we were chosen this year as the clinical team of the year. Great recognition, um, great team. Obviously not everybody is there, but um, again, just a, just an honor. You can see Cheryl, our VP of nursing to the left and our uh, CEO of Vimo Patel on the right hand side there. So uh, had a little monetary reward to it and just a, a great recognition for, for our team. We've done so much great work here. What have we learned? What are our lessons? You know, I, again, I love to go to quotes. Um, you know, there's never, just you know, for, for everybody out there, there'll never be enough time in life to get, you know, accomplish what we need to do, but we need to remember that everything we do today will benefit our patients in the future. Continue to be an advocate. I wanted this for 15 years. I had a vision when I really started to understand IV therapy. And my goal was to make it happen. And as I always told my staff a million times over, Rome was not built in a day. We have to just keep at it and keep at it, keep at it. And not everything goes as planned. We've had to adjust our plan a million times over the course of um, when we started this study. One of my favorite quotes is plan A didn't work, keep your cool. There are 24 and more letters to the alphabet. So I think we went through the whole alphabet. We had to plan change our plan so many times, but I love the one on the bottom, giving up on your goal because one setback is like slashing your other three tires because you got a flat. Again, there's two reasons that I've heard out there, time and support. Don't let it stop you from accomplishing your goals. I didn't always have the time. I didn't always have the support, but I just kept at it. I'm persistent. I must admit, I don't give up and you know, it's, it's just completely paid off. So in summary, we know what the problem is, we can fix it. Our patients need and want us, you know, and our healthcare is our change. Healthcare is changing constantly. It's the only constant in healthcare. And, and just look at what's happening today. I mean, it's just crazy. 
IV therapy affects every patient and we should be collecting data. And if you're a lean hospital and using Six Sigma, use it to your advantage because it's all about limiting waste. Without data, just remember, you're just another person with an opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. And that was great. I enjoyed that thoroughly, but we do have some questions now. So Lee's um, contact information is up there. And if you want to contact just him, let's go through some of these questions. Do you have some time? I sure do. Yay, I'm so glad. Was a 1.75 inch catheter used for every PIV insertion or just the ultrasound guided? Uh, we used it for every IV insertion. We actually probably 90% of the catheters that we put in present day, even if we're not using ultrasound, is the 1.75 inch. Very rarely are we putting one inch. And if we do, it's usually on an outpatient basis. And just so people are aware, cost containment is obviously very huge in a hospital. The actual kit that we use with the CHX dressing and the extension set with the anti-reflux design, we do not put that out for general public use. My team has only access to that, but we also have the standard IV start kit um, with not that equipment in it. And we use that when we go to the ED and we know somebody's just gonna be there for fluids to get discharged, or if we go to an outpatient area and we know that they're gonna be discharged right after procedure, we use that. So that's a way that we control costs. And if any of the outpatient areas or the ED, those nurses that are trained in putting IVs, they're just using the standard um, supplies that um, we were using before we started with our team. Leo wants to clarify that at your hospital are all PIVs inserted by the vascular access specialty team? So all peripheral IVs on the inpatient units, and we have about 18 of them. The only places that we don't go to are, well, we go to there if we're requested, but we do train the nurses in the labor and delivery area and we train the nurses who are going into the ICUs, and we have five of those. All other areas, all the step-down units, telemetry units, surgical units, medical surgical units, we do all the IV sites in that area. We've also uh, had, we did a trial where we did have a nurse put down, down in the ED. Um, it was a great success. There was some leadership uh, changes that occurred down there, but we're, I have a meeting with them tomorrow um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how do we get this back up and running? Because it, the, the nurses um, that were working down there were saying, well, geez, you know, the IV teams out there doing all the IVs on the inpatient floors, how come we can't have them down here as a resource? So we're trying to revisit that. Um, right after our trial ended down there, they actually were hoping that they could get 24-7 coverage of having one of us down there, not to put in every IV, but to help guide nurses and making better decisions in the veins that they chose teach coach and mentoring them but also um you know do, using us for those patients that they just would walk in and not see anything so we're, we're really hoping we want to get down it because that to me that would be really achieving our vision and goal of that one catheter per patient stay and and what a great study just to to follow an IV that we put in in the ed all the way to the end of the patient treatment so that is awesome. More to come with. How many beds Eight. does your hospital have? Yeah. And how big is your hospital system? It's a three-part question, by the way. And does your hospital system, does every hospital within the system have a vascular access specialty team? So we are an 867-bed facility. We currently have, I believe, five hospitals in our system. We had just we just acquired um, St. Vincent's, which is down on the shoreline level. Um, one of our uh, hospitals, Bacchus, down in Norwich, they have an IV team down there. Um, our other hospital, New Britain, which is about 400 beds, I believe, um, it's called Hospital of Central Connecticut. They actually had an IV team, which they uh, they had a VP who came in there and didn't think it was necessary, so they just uh, they cut it. Um, this was um, quite a few years ago. Um, but um, been working very closely with them. They just decided to bring back the IV team. They're going to start small, which is fine. So um, we're having a lot of conversations with them on, um, you know, doing, trying to emulate what we've done over here to there. My VP has reached out to all C-suite personnel in all the various hospitals showing the work we've done and, you know, really promoting it and trying to say, hey, we should make this a standard of care. 
across the system. So I'm hoping, I'm, I'm very um, optimistic. Um, and again, I'm very persistent. So I'm just trying to fight, find the right people. I do have a lot of requests from the various hospitals, even if it's ED nurses who were already kind of being used as the SWAT teams, as we call them, um, that are coming here for all our training just um, to see what we've done. So to answer your question, one hospital does, one hospital's uh, building theirs, and I'm not going to stop until every hospital in our system has a FAFS team. So that's my next um, long-term vision. That's a great vision. So our Herbst Award winner, Dr. Jack Ledun, would like to know, or it mentions that you're using tissue adhesive in your presentation. And are you, you, are you referring to that as a uh, cyanoacrylate or is that more of a gum mastic? Now, I think it's Jack Ladon, isn't it? Not John Ladon, but anyways, um, <laughs> That's it, it his is real name. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, is it? I, maybe I did not know. Yes, uh, Jack, because I know you as Jack, the term dressing adhesive does definitely fit better. So thank you for correcting me. Have you had any skin reaction using your gum mastic? We've only had one to date, which was uh, okay. evaluated and reported. And the patient actually had a, just a, a, a laundry list of allergies, latex, um, bananas, avocados. I mean, you name it, this woman was allergic to everything under the sun. So, see, so we have Chad asking about um, telling us his IV team was eliminated a few years ago for cost savings. Are you able to share your cost savings analysis as a starting point? to use for discussion with this hospital. Yeah, I would recommend Chad reach out to me and anybody who I've spoken who is on um, listening to this presentation, feel free to email me. I'd love to you know, talk with you and maybe get some, uh, some preliminary data from you. We can talk about how we can justify uh, working to get a team back in your facility. I'd love to help people, that's my goal. Do you recommend using alcohol swab type caps on all PIVs to present prevent bloodstream infection? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I I would love to say that, you know, here, um, everybody's scrubbing the hub for the required time of 30 seconds and letting it dry. It does not happen. So, yes, I highly recommend that we, whenever we brought in the alcohol caps, we immediately um, instituted on all, on all um, ports of entry to the patient. Do you work on babies, NICU babies? That or I micro do not. I have a, uh, I have a, uh, um, a lot of uh, respect for those who do. I do not though. So Lee, what does your vascular access team look like right now with the COVID situation? Are you placing pumps? <laughs> we just talked about this outside the room and doing site assessments from the door. It feels like my expert advice is being ignored during this crisis. Any advice for all of us out here? Uh, my gosh, it's a very, uh, it's a hot topic. You know, I am not in favor of pumps outside the room. You know, unfortunately, I did find out last night that uh, it started to be uh, done here at Hartford Hospital on, on a very select um, group of patients. Um, how were we managing this before? You know, with all, so basically we have about three wards that have um, either positive patients or rule out. Um, so it's a very tough situation. So normally we would round on all these patients that are brand new to the hospital. Um, we had to actually stop that because, and it wasn't to protect my staff. It really wasn't to, um, it was really about the shortage of PPE. So, you know, if we were going into an assess an IV site, um, that was fine. I mean, we just wasted a gown, uh, you know, face mask with shields, gloves, and we just are, everybody's struggling to get the right equipment into their hospital. So what we did was those floors that are housing those patients, we went back to just let us know, um, you know, what we need to do. Let us know when that IV catheter fails, and we will come and put that IV in. Um, but since I found out that the pumps outside the room, I have, I have gone back to my staff and said, okay, when you go to these units, I want every single patient that has a pump outside the room, make sure you get in there and look at that IVC, IV site, and make sure they have a good one. It, you know, I, I, it just, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up straight when I heard that this was happening, just because I do get, I, I know what those sites look like prior to us taking over. And I just know that, um, you know, nurses are not getting the education they need in schools anymore um, about 
how to manage IV therapy. And it's an art and a science and it's a skill and it needs to be handled by the experts who know the right vein to choose from and that they're going to reduce those complications. So it's a, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's a tough situation and we all have to, you know, think out of the box and do things differently. And obviously if we do get, um, you know, our mass uh, quantity of PPE that we're all looking for, then we will go back to rounding for sure. So great question. Okay, we're going to take just a couple more. Appreciate your staying on a little longer Absolutely. on this, Lee. What did you do to cover the pain with PIV insertion? So, you know, it's a we we do not do lidocaine. Um, I know there's some places that do. Honestly, a 22 gauge um, in the mid forearm going to the cephalic pain, the cephalic vein, patients do not feel it barely at all. You put an IV in the AC, you put an IV in the hand, you put an IV in the wrist patients are going to feel that and that's the areas that we're avoiding so we it's not it's not something that we hear um, is a problem of course the patient feel you know is already anticipating the pain but you know once we're done we'll usually say to how's that feel and they're like wow I didn't feel that at all where were you when we, I was in the ED and I needed you as the, the comments we hear a lot of times so very good and obviously, if there is a patient that is just super highly anxious and really nervous, we will use a, a small blood of lidocaine. But as I always tell patients, you know, I'm going to have to stick you with a needle in order to numb the area. So, you know, by telling them, listen, we're, we're, we're an experts. We do this with ultrasound. And, you know, we greater than 90 percent of the time, we're going to get it in on the first stick. And they're generally like, OK, go for it. So. Did RN satisfaction increase once your team expanded and took over that support role of IVs? Um, I, I know anecdotally when I'm out there, um, I just had a conversation with somebody today who was talking about how wonderful it is that she doesn't need to put IVs anymore. They're, you know, they're sat there. You walk through the halls of Hartford Hospital, you don't hear pumps beeping anymore. Whereas before that was a common um, noise that was heard. Why were those pumps beating? beeping well because they were in the ac or they were in the hand and half of them were occlusion so the nurses are spending less time having to go in worry about their sites they know they're walking into a quality site they they're not having to go and address alarm so i truly and i think it's a great thing that you know that after you just asked me that question i might actually you know put together a survey um to get out there and maybe i'll show the results in a future presentation that i do but definitely i think there are quite a few satisfied nurses out there with us taking over and doing them. Of course, there's always that 20% that are upset that we took the skill away from them. And, you know, they'll say, you know, I love putting IVs. Well, there's a difference between love putting in IVs um, versus doing it the right way, you know, and it's, it's obviously some nurses feel like you're taking, you know, another task away from me. And as I put it, well, you know, if we were doing it right the first time, you know, I wouldn't have done this. I mean, I tried every way to try to teach nurses how to do it properly um, once um, yeah, I had full control of the education process. And it, and it just, no matter what we did, we changed our plans, we changed our education process so many different ways. We still had nurses reverting back to once they were done with us, dropping them in the AC and dropping them in the hand. And, you know, the pictures, again, you saw them. That's what we saw. That's what we see still being done out there with, with nurses who are putting them in, who, um, you know, love putting them IVs, but just are putting them in where they are comfortable. So it's, it's you know, it's the right thing to do. Everything's getting to be more of a specialized service. We got wound care nurses out there. We've got case coordination. We've got, um, you know, we've got RRT teams, co-teams, I mean, you name it, you know, and, and the reason why is because better outcomes occur when we put it into the hands of experts. My team even drops dog hop feeding tubes, okay? So they don't love doing it, but we did it for a reason because we do it every single day and we do enough volume of it that it's the right thing to do with the patient. We're abiding by our core values, integrity, safety, excellence, and caring. And that's why we do it. I think Tanya Stevens set me up on this one. Do you use a probe cover on every ultrasound guided PIV? 
Uh, very interesting question. We're definitely evaluating them and working um, on that and instituting that standard care practice. So, but the technique we use, we are definitely doing the safe thing. But I understand that it is a it is a lot of uh, conversation about that. We are definitely going to be doing that very shortly. So, great question, Tanya. And thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> I've got to sneak this last one in, though. Um, <laughs> do you have a set? Are the are the one and the same? Your Folks that are placed in PIVs, do they also place picks and midlines? So um, with, with new hires that I bring in, just because of the length of um, training that we do with pick and midline insertions, we start them um, just getting them comfortable with sterile technique, dressing changes, putting in for IVs, doing for IVs with ultrasound. And then once I know they're committed and they love what they're doing, we get them into pick and midline training. So yes, I want cross coverage. I want my nurses to be able to do be able to walk in and be able to drop a dob off to be able to put a pick in a midline or a purple IV um, any day of the week. So that is my ultimate end goal. Exceptional. This was a great, great educational event. Thank you, Lee. Thanks everybody for thank you, everybody. stayed on. Um, and, and, and please everybody stay safe out there and thank you for all you do. Um, it's, we're definitely in different times and I'm just, uh, it's an honor to be able to, um, you know, to know that we're there's such a group, great group of people out there caring for patients who have such a difficult time. But on that note, please be safe as well. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.